Good evening and welcome to Midweek. Coming up on tonight's show, last week we revealed that Larry Murphy is holed up in Amsterdam. Unfortunately, the people living there didn't know they had a convicted rapist living among them. As these revelations make headlines across Europe, we ask, what now for the beast of Balting Glass? And with a number of high-profile names being jailed recently, we look at Christmas inside Mount Joy. But first tonight, as it's budget night, we decided to get the immediate reaction, if any, from the public to today's budget outside the Dáil. Earlier on, I spoke with Midweek's Kira Doherty, and I started by asking her what's been happening down there today. At around 4.30 this afternoon, Nora, a small group gathered outside the central bank and they made their way over here to Leinster House where they have been protesting for the last number of hours. Of course, they're protesting about Budget 2013 and the €3.5 billion Euro worth of adjustments that were contained in that. It's actually a very small crowd, only a num couple of hundred of people. And when you think about it, only a fortnight ago, around 10,000 people gathered right here and took part in an anti-austerity march. Now that might be because a number of the big ticket items in this budget were already leaked. Having spoken to the crowd here, the mood is certainly one of anger and defiance and I have witnessed a number of scuffles with the Gardaí. The two main issues that are really vexing them are the property tax and the cuts to child benefits. Since we started these austerity measures, Nora, there's been about eight new taxes. They include the household tax and the insurance levy, the universal social charge, the pension levy and now of course this property tax and what protesters are saying this evening is that this tax fails to take into account the ability of people to pay. They're treating a property as if it's an asset whereas to a number of people it's a liability. They say it doesn't reflect the number of people in negative equity, it doesn't reflect the 170,000 people in mortgage arrears and it doesn't reflect the stamp duty that people have paid. As we know from the household charge there has been a massive act of defiance. Over 50% of households haven't paid it and the protesters that I have spoken to have said this is going to continue. We're simply not going to pay this tax. Now, the people here this evening are generally from Sinn Féin, from Ergy and from people uh, against profits. And what they're saying is that Labour have completely let the Irish public down when it comes to child benefit. They made a promise, Nora, when they were electioneering a couple of years ago that if they made it to government, they wouldn't touch child benefit. And today, as we know, they have announced cuts. As I said, only a very small crowd here, Nora. I think the government probably expected, given the nature of this budget, that it would be much bigger, but it is very small. They're saying, look, this is only the start of it. We've had five, nearly six austerity budgets, and what they're saying is they're simply not working. There is no evidence that the country is emerging from the crisis, despite what some of the ministers were saying this afternoon. They're saying this is the start of it, and they promise that these protests are going to get bigger and are going to continue. But in terms of the property Tax, they're definitely not going to pay. That's just the start of it. Back to you, Nora. Thank you, Kira, for that report. Now, people living in Amsterdam were shocked and angry when we revealed on last week's show that the dangerous rapist Larry Murphy was living there. The following morning, a number of Dutch television stations approached us for information. Midweek's Michael Ryan has this report. Van de zwaarste criminelen uit het land blijkt nu een onbezorgd leven te leiden in Amsterdam. Larry Murphy. Last Thursday night's news on Dutch national TV channel RTL was all about Larry Murphy. The newsreaders say Irish people were shocked to hear that one of their most notorious criminals seemed to be living the good life in Amsterdam. Larry Murphy, they said, had spent years in jail and that a crime reporter had found him living in the Dutch capital. Just 24 hours earlier, most people living in Amsterdam had never even heard of Larry Murphy. But last week's shocking revelations on midweek that one of Ireland's biggest sex offenders was living in the city and hanging around with another convicted Irish sex offender changed all that. They go to work together, they go fishing together, they, go, they actually are inseparable. No communication with anybody else. Yes. And a lot of people would say, okay, they would say maybe Larry Murphy is a reformed character and he's trying to get on with his life and that, that would be fair. But uh, even the, the most experienced um, uh, people dealing with sex offenders or whatever would say to you that that is a very disturbing development. And it is a very disturbing development 
because these two gentlemen are together. When we talked to sources here, they expressed grave concern that these two people were together. The morning after the show, we got calls from television stations in Amsterdam asking if they could use the midweek footage to warn their viewers Murphy was in the city. Dutch websites soon had the latest photos of him, taken from the previous night's midweek. This one asked readers how much they really knew about their neighbours, while a third website spoke about the dangerous Irish criminal who lives and works in Amsterdam. The Dutch people were angry that Murphy had been living in their midst since January and they knew nothing about it. Another TV station, AT5, interviewed local women who live in his neighbourhood. This lady said it was horrible to hear the news. She said there are many women and children living in the area and she was frightened when she saw the reports. Meanwhile, this lady also said it was scary and that Murphy shouldn't have been allowed to move into the area. She said people living nearby should have been told and that Amsterdam is an open society, but not for these kinds of people. Police in Amsterdam said they had been informed earlier this year about Murphy's presence by officers from Europol in The Hague, but they weren't given a fixed address. They said they would be visiting him in light of the latest revelations, but couldn't bow to pressure that he should be followed because he isn't suspected of any crimes. Meanwhile, back home, the Irish newspapers also ran with the story for the next few days and into last weekend. More than two years after being released from prison, Murphy still sells papers. One story quoted a pregnant woman living in Amsterdam who said she hired the carpenter as a handyman to do work in her house after being introduced to him in a pub. She even gave him her house key to come and go as he pleased and couldn't believe it when she found out who he was. This CCTV footage from a bar near Murphy's flat also emerged, showing him on a night out. The owner told newspapers in Holland that he turned up most weeks with his sex offender friend to drink pints and play pool. Other bar owners told an Irish paper last weekend that they'd be printing posters with Murphy's face on them to warn staff and other drinkers that he was in the area. This time last week, Larry Murphy was living anonymously in Amsterdam. One week on, all that's changed. Before we discuss the fallout since last week with my guests in the studio, I'm joined now via Skype by Sander Paulus from RTL from Amsterdam, who we featured in Michael's package. Good evening, Sander, and thanks for joining us this evening. Can I start by asking you, how did you first hear about Larry Murphy? Good evening, Nora. Well, it was the biggest Dutch newspaper who started all this, and then we all, well, were surprised enough to give it a hand because... Um, we saw the Irish foot. We saw the footage of the Irish television, you know, of your uh, journalist, and then we thought, "What is happening here?" So we found out, and um, then we saw what happened with Larry Murphy and his way of life, bringing him to Amsterdam. And what was the reaction of people living in Amsterdam, Sander? Was the, the people were shocked, not only in Amsterdam but nationwide, because we air nationwide, we broadcast nationwide, and um, there was a lot of turmoil about. You know, why doesn't the police do anything? What's happening here? Why can he live here like this, with this background of him, with his rape? And, and we were surprised, not to say the least, that he was living here like there was nothing wrong, Nora. It was, well, kind of unbelievable for the people in Holland that it just goes like that. But on the other hand, I have to say, um, there is something more to that, of course, because... In Holland, he didn't do any crimes, not yet. What did the Dutch police actually say about him? Well, we called them, of course. Uh, we, we asked them what their opinion was. Was he on any list or something? Yeah, he was on a Europol signaling list. But it doesn't mean anything. It just means that we know that he's there. But the police doesn't have any people to observe him. And like I said, it's, it's, uh, they wouldn't know where to start forming observations teams, observation teams or anything like that because there are a lot of people on the signaling list of Europol and Larry Murphy is just one of them. And is he believed to be still living in Amsterdam, Sander? Well, this was the biggest news maybe of the evening because when we started to uh, ask some questions, um, quite quickly came clear that the police have no knowledge of his whereabouts at this moment. Is there a feeling perhaps that Ireland has exported one of its problems to your country? 
No, no, not at all. It, it's, you know, it's just the way he planned his visit, his stay here in Amsterdam. It's not like we think that the Irish put him here in Amsterdam to make our life miserable. Not at all. This is not a problem at all. It's, it's just, well, unfortunate that he that he's, uh, came to Amsterdam. Well, thank you very much, Sandra, for joining us here on Midweek this evening. And I'm joined now by Midweek reporter Michael Ryan, a journal columnist with the Irish Independent Kevin Myers, and barrister Paul Anthony McDermott. You're all very welcome indeed. Michael, I have to come to you first. What exactly happened last Thursday morning after the show was aired on Wednesday? Well, I suppose, Laura, we, we knew it was going to be big uh, last Wednesday night. I mean, no one had really heard or seen from Larry Murphy in about two years since he walked uh, free from Arbor Hill back in uh, 2010. On Wednesday night, uh, I was on Twitter myself just having a look around and hashtag Larry Murphy, hashtag midweek were sort of two of the top things trending that night. So we knew it was, it was a big story. Got into the office here on uh, Thursday morning and uh, a couple of Dutch TV stations had already been on, uh, Sanders station uh, being one one of them, um, but a couple more were on as well, asking us who Larry Murphy was, saying they'd never heard of him, wondering if they could have the footage to use um, in their own reports that night. Sander works for a national uh, television station in Holland, um, and they felt that it was something that uh, everybody living in, in Holland uh, needed to know about. I mean, I suppose we all know who Larry Murphy is over here. We'd seen his photo. He'd been very high profile over there. Um, it was just a complete bolt from the blue, so it was, uh, it was a shock to them. So, uh, in my interview there with Sander, it's, it's clear that nobody there knew of the existence of this man. I mean, but you did speak uh, to somebody from Europol or had some discussion with them, didn't you? Well, Europol um, had told the uh, authorities uh, in Holland, uh, they're obliged to tell the authorities in Holland that he was going to Holland. But I mean, beyond that, um, they, the police uh, said that they didn't, they weren't told exactly where he was going to be in, in Amsterdam. Um, they have said, because obviously um, Sander has contacted them since, and they basically told them that, you know, they're not obliged to, I mm. suppose everyone's immediate reaction is we should follow this guy, but um, they're not obliged to do that. Um, you know, he, he's done his time as far as they're concerned over there. He's not wanted for any crimes, which he isn't. And, um, you know, they, they couldn't possibly follow mm. everybody around. So uh, that's where it ends really for mm. them. Well, Kevin, you You've been writing about this case and uh, with a lot of anger, I think, in your column about how this man would only have served the length of sentence that he served. Yes, it's absurd on, on a number of, of counts. Um, the first is that essentially he um, had hit the, the clock on the punitive tariff, was turned off halfway through the night. For everything that happened after then, he, uh, he received no further punishment. He, ha he had received his maximum sentence almost by, 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 by the first rape. Multiple rapes followed, uh, an abduction, car theft, much violence, uh, 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 an ordeal more terrible than any of us can imagine. Yet after a certain point, the 15-year sentence that he got would have already been earned. And do you think he should have been getting sentenced for each of the crimes for he each, committed? For each offence, mm. it makes sense that you are punished separately and additionally. It, it, it violates all common sense that he should cease to be punished at a certain point. And then there comes to the point he only got 15 years. Um, he, he was then given full remission. For what? But how could he have earned remission when he refused to have any sexual therapy? This but is, there's, this, there's no obligation on a, on a prisoner in Arbor Hill to take There's no therapy. obligation for a governor to make a decision to give full remission. There is no obligation. That is a discretionary matter up to the governor, as you as former minister would know. It, the governor made a decision. That man should be in jail now. And he should be, of course, doing much more than 15 mm. years. Well, Any one of those rapes would have been worth 15 mm. years. Well, maybe I'll turn to you, Paul Anthony. Generally speaking, uh, can the courts hand down consecutive sentences for a number of crimes, like, uh, try not to be specific to this one, but just generally? They can, but they don't. What a judge has to do is he or she has to impose a sentence for every crime you've been convicted of. But then at the end of the sentencing, the judge has to decide, will all of those sentences run together or will they run after each other? And there are only a couple of areas in our law where a judge has to add them up so they run after each other. For example, if you commit an offence whilst on bail, that offence has to be added to any other sentence you have. Equally, if you commit a crime whilst you're in prison as a prisoner, that sentence can only begin when you've served your existing sentence. But after that, judges have a choice. And what seems to happen is if events occur as part of a single transaction, a single incident, the judge is more likely to say 
all of those sentences will run together. Whereas if you have raped a number of women on different occasions, in those circumstances, the judge is more likely to say, well, they're completely different incidents. All of those crimes should be added up. So, so they could give consecutive sentences, but only if it's either in a different location, different crime. I mean, Kevin's point that this man had done many serious things, all of which would have led to a big sentence, and yet it's all lumped together. Could I mean, the judge not in this instance have given him, we could have given him life, couldn't he? I mean, one thing to remember is rape carries a life sentence. It's the same sentence for murder. The only difference being for murder, the life sentence is mandatory, whereas with rape, it's discretionary. Mm -hmm. And I've never understood why more life sentences aren't handed down for rape, because the fact you get a life sentence doesn't mean you serve life. What it means is it's now a matter for the governor and the minister for justice to look at you after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years and see, have you rehabilitated yourself? If you have after 10 years, then maybe you are safe. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have changed your ways. But equally, if you don't avail of those programs, if you haven't changed, there's no particular reason why you should ever spend a single day at liberty again. Well, and obviously if you get life, I mean, life, our viewers will be wondering, what exactly is a life sentence? Because they know, don't hear people, people imagine, staying there forever. And they don't. Most people would imagine if you get a life sentence, that means you're carried out of Manchoy in a coffin. What it means is the judge has said you should serve life. But under our constitution, the judge selects the sentence, but then the government and the Minister for Justice and the governors, they decide how much of that sentence you're actually going to mm. serve. And in some cases that can work, because clearly in some cases somebody may have committed one murder in a moment of fury, they're never likely to re-offend, and after 10 or 15 years, if they've tried to educate themselves, tried to go to programmes, mm. there probably isn't a lot of point of view locking them up till they mm. die. Kevin, I mean, clearly you're not happy with that situation. I, I, mean, I you don't, don't you, understand it. Yeah, I you, just don't understand how this man, and we know the background, it was during a spate, uh, a, a serial of serial murders of women in, we believe, in the Kildare, Carlow, um, Wicklow area. Now, it is incomprehensible to me, as it is to your audience at home, that mm. it, it, in this context, a man who... Now, we uh, just have to be careful, he wasn't convicted of he, any, other, I said, any of those But he people, was yeah. a suspect. Mm. He was and remains a suspect. It is incomprehensible that a suspect... Uh, it, it, f you know, in, in, this, in this tragedy, could have received only 15 years. And mm. incomprehensible is the word. I just do not understand how this I is don't, possible. I have to say, I don't have any personal knowledge that he is still a suspect. There's no doubt he was questioned about it. But be that as it may, he is um, a man who has committed heinous at the time, crimes. At the time of uh, the offence, which was of quite shocking and un uh, unparalleled brutality, he was believed to be... Um, a, a suspect. Th there have been no murders of that kind in the area since, since his, his conviction. And it, I, I believe that we have to create, and this is a, a more contentious issue, that we should create a, a, a special dispensation when there is a serial killer uh, at work. That the ordinary evidential rules don't apply and the ordinary judgmental rules don't apply so that we can d d employ special legal measures as we do in the special criminal court. Mm -hmm. We can recognise that uh, there are circumstances which mean that ordinary jury trials don't apply as they do with criminals mm -hmm. and terrorists. And we must also recognise the special need if we have another, God forbid, uh, serial killer in our midst. Mm. Well, we don't know. Larry Murphy wasn't convicted of being a serial, serial killer. No, but, but I know what you're saying. So you'd like to see the law being changed to allow the, the kind of multiple offences to be taken more into account, Absolutely. rather than just in this Well, case. there are two things. One is the way a, a, a crime like this is investigated, and, and, mm. and that's one aspect. But then how is it dealt with when you, when you have got a conviction? Mm. Well, you deal with it with such severity that the person you have found guilty will never, ever see the light of day, ever, mm. outside a jail. Could, could we, Paul Anthony, bring in legislation to stop somebody like Larry Murphy or somebody who's convicted like he was of travelling? I mean, could his passport, could that be part of the sentence, that his passport would be taken away from him so that at least he would be in the country where he committed the offence? It's very difficult to do that, particularly in the European Union, because, of course, one of your rights is freedom of travel, and it's very difficult once somebody served their time. Surely somebody who's done the kind of crimes he committed, you, some of your rights you lose them. I think so, and I think 
there's a lot in what Kevin Mai said in this regard. One of the rules of evidence we have is you can't tell a jury about the fact a person has previous convictions. And some of the time that makes sense. Clearly, mm -hmm. if you're dealing with a shoplifter or somebody who's committed a minor crime, if you told the jury he's already been convicted in the past, the jury wouldn't give them a fair trial because the jury would be focusing on mm -hmm. what they did in the past. I think it's different where you deal with somebody who may be suspected of being a multiple rapist. If somebody, for example, is going into court saying, I thought there was consent or it was an accident. I've never understood why the jury can't be told, look, you can listen to that explanation, you can choose to believe it, but by the way, this person has been convicted three times in the past for rape. Why shouldn't members of the public be allowed to have regard to that? And in a sense, in a way, lawyers think members of the public are stupid. We trust people to be on a jury. We trust mm. them to take the oath seriously. So why don't we trust them to do their job knowing all of the facts? And so couldn't, couldn't that be changed, Paul Anthony, by, in the court rules? Yes, judges could change the law. However, it may also um, need prompting by legislation. But there's yeah. no doubt... But not necessarily new legislation nope, judges could, could actually be in the court Absolutely. rules. I mean, Michael, when you were, were making your original film and involved mm. in it, uh, I'm sure you got concerns expressed that this person, although he had served a sentence, is quite likely to offend again. Yeah, I mean, like, as we were saying last week with, with uh, when Paul Williams was on, my, I mean, first, there's a fascination with this whole Larry Murphy story, um, the likes of which, you know, Paul even said that he'd never seen before, and, you, you know, we know all the articles he's written on various different uh, criminals. Um, he, he's, he's almost like, you know, uh, a Lord Lucan-type figure in, in Ireland, uh, Larry Murphy, and I suppose, you know, in that people see him everywhere. He, he was in Kilkenny, he was in Leitrim, he was in Longford, he was in Cork, he, he was all over the place. And I suppose... But not in Jail. Well, not yeah, a man enjoy jail. Mm. Um, but one of the things, I suppose, is that, um, you know, and, and that, that we wanted people, I suppose, to take out of the, the programme uh, last week and again this week, I suppose, is that, like, um, he, he's not in man enjoy jail, but he's not, he do, he's not in Ireland because um, people are... There's a genuine concern and fear out there that people think mm. that he's, he's coming back in and out of the country. He's not. From what we can gather, he's abroad. He doesn't want to be in Ireland because the, the good thing about, um, you know, the fact that people are so fascinated with him and the papers are so fascinated with him is that at every, I, I think... Most most people know his face at this stage. I know. Kevin, I mean, would you be wanting to lock him up and throw away the key? There's no question about that. Mm. And everyone at home wants the same thing. I we, know, you yes. know, Just for that night alone. We yeah. don't have to prove anything else against him for what he did to that young woman. Mm -hmm. He deserves to be in jail for the rest of his life. And no question of um, release of any kind, ever. I know, um, yeah. it just, it's deranged. You asked about the passport. We resupplied him with a passport. That's in right, Spain. he got a new passport. Yeah. Yes, so recently. So this yeah. is mad. This, yes. this is dysfunctional. This is fatuous. Well, maybe perhaps the, the, the results of this, and, and now that he has turned up in Amsterdam, will make, maybe perhaps the judges, we can't interfere with the judges, maybe they will look again at how they pass sentences on somebody of such a heinous nature. I think it's fair to say our criminal justice system is very, very good at dealing with crimes which have already occurred. What we've never really come to grips with, because it's so difficult, is how do we deal with people where we think they'll commit future know, crimes? On the one hand, the public have to be protected, but on the other hand, you get into very dangerous territory where you start locking people up or restricting them for crimes mm. they may commit yes, but may not commit. Well, we can't solve that problem tonight, but thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Coming up after the break... He was once Ireland's richest man, but now photos show him spending his evenings playing poker in Mount Joy Prison. Stay with us. He was once the richest man in Ireland, but new pictures have now emerged of Sean Quinn playing poker with fellow inmates in Mountjoy Prison. 
Joining us now to discuss the photos and prison life in general with Christmas coming up is Alison O'Reilly from the Irish Mail on Sunday, which published the photos, and Evelyn Byrne, who's the former chairperson of the Docus Centre Visiting Committee. Good evening to you both. Alison, can I turn to you first? Um, the photos, where did they come from? How did you get them? Well, I can't tell you that. Sorry, but um, they were given to me. I was asked if we were interested in using them. And given, I suppose, the high public profile that Sean Quinn has, our editor decided to use them just to show the public how he's getting on behind bars. So we got them in the last week and decided to, to use them. And does Sean Quinn know you got them? No. Nobody knows we got them. I, I mean, it's not something that would happen in a lot of the prisons, you know, where you're allowed well, to Well, my bring knowledge it. would tell me yeah. that you're not meant to take photos No, you're not, the you're not. But yeah. I suppose we made the decision, Nora, because... He's a very famous person at the moment and our editor believed that it was right to publish these pictures given the nature of why he's in prison and what had happened. Um, the Quinn family, I suppose, in the last few weeks have sort of, you know, engaged in a campaign of sympathy towards, you know, Sean Quinn and his son and their nephew, Peter. And basically, you know, we had seen photos of Sean Quinn Sr. crying down in the court. Um, there's been a lot of rallies, there's been a lot of emotion. He has supporters, obviously. But, um, you know, we had seen his, his legal team basically saying that this man was 66 years old. He has a heart problem. You know, it was horrible to send him to prison. It wasn't the right time. And I suppose we were given the image that you know, he was going to end up in something like Kilmainham Jail, a dark sort of, you know, dull cell or maybe Mountjoy Prison itself where he has to slop out, where it's really badly overcrowded. But these pictures show that he's actually doing quite well. You know, he's being looked after. He's in a semi-open prison. He's with prisoners that are reaching the end of their sentences and have engaged well in the services. It's, by all accounts, you know, a very well-run prison. Um, and it's different in the sense that, you know, each prisoner has a key to the their own cell. You're not locked, is locked he in up. A, is he in a single cell? He was sharing with someone for the first two or three weeks and in the last week I understand he's been moved to a single cell which is on the bottom floor near the, um, the ACO's office and I suppose you know unlike the, the, the prisons in Ireland, the majority of prisons, he's able to wander around, you know, we've seen pictures of him playing poker with the lads in the gym in the evening, uh, which is open from nine to seven in the evenings. Um, he's able to play poker, he's able to play badminton if he wants, there's a treadmill there. Um, it's quite a warm and cosy prison, he's mixing in very well with people. But he's not doing or getting any special treatment there other than any of the other prisoners no, he's in the not. training No, because it's a semi-open prison, which mm. is a lot different to the prison, the other prisons. Um, and I suppose he can't get out to see his family and he doesn't have his freedom as such. But he can roam around. He struck up a, a friendship with the garlic fraudster, Paul Begley. Um, they're quite pally. He can roam up and down to his cell, which is upstairs. Um, he can go in and play, you know, poker with the lads. He can have his cups of tea. He can hang around the cell reading his books. He can read the newspapers. And it's quite you, relaxed. Have you got Got any sense that he's going to look for and would he get temporary release for Christmas Day? Well he has put in for compassionate leave for his his grandchild's christening but we we, we haven't we've no you know we've That's no a matter for that. the governor yeah. and all yeah, the minister. Exactly and it's yeah. all dealt with on a case by case basis mm. he has asked for it but he's in for nine weeks and we just felt that given his high profile and given the fact that you know his own son went on to the Late Late Show and said you know the, the, the training unit was very much a lonely place and that he felt quite worried that his father was going to be in there and that a man in his 30s would do better than a man in his 60s mm. in there. We can see that he's quite relaxed. Seems relaxed, playing yeah. hard. Evelyn, you've been served on the DOCAS Women's Prisons Board uh -huh. um, and were you surprised to see those photos? I was, just, uh, I was disappointed. Mm. I think that we live in a democratic society. We have a system which says that when somebody is found guilty, they are sentenced to prison. That is their sentence. It's not to be harassed by taking photographs. They're not entitled to anything more than any other person, but they're not entitled to any less either. And I think that's where I would have the issue, that they're doing their time, they have gone through the system, the judge has decided what his sentence is to be. It's not for the media or for papers to decide what a person's sentence is. And I think when you say something like he's lost his freedom as such, I think, you know, have you ever been in a prison? Have you ever spent a couple of nights in mm -hmm. a prison? Because no, that sound, even as, a, even, even as a visitor going in, that sense when the door closes behind you, the absolute isolation that people feel, 
the difference in their lives, first of all, but also that they're left with their thoughts, there's a loneliness, there's family behind. I don't think there's any prisoner who doesn't have their own issues, their own demons to deal with. And I think that's their punishment. Their loss of liberty well, is their punishment. Evelyn, as I say, you were on the board of, of Dorcas. Uh, another high-profile prisoner that has just gone in is Heather Perrin. Um, and what's it going to be like for somebody like Heather Perrin or any other woman going into Dorcas now coming up to Christmas? I suppose I wouldn't like to comment on any particular prisoner no, not because particular no more, one, no. the more that I'm saying about Sean yeah. Quinn, I think that, that uh, Mrs Perrin is entitled to her privacy. There is no woman, no woman in Dokus tonight who isn't dealing with some issue. Whether it's somebody who has lost reputation, whether it's somebody who has left children be home, at home, whether it's somebody who's dealing with addiction. So I think every prisoner who goes in has an issue that they are dealing with themselves and so it's extremely difficult. I remember one of the most heartbreaking letters I ever got was from a gentleman who wrote to me as the chairperson of Dokus. His wife had been found uh, guilty of fraud she was spending some time. He wasn't claiming she was innocent, he wasn't claiming that she was badly treated in the prison, quite the contrary, he said you know everything was as it should be. But he was trying to explain to me how this woman was literally fading away in front of him, how he was afraid that she wouldn't come back out, not for anything that was being done to her but what the experience was doing to her. So I think that unless you've actually experienced that door closing behind you, those particularly those first few nights when you're left alone to face mm. whatever length of time it is. I think unless you've really experienced that, it's not for us to judge. You know, we, we have a very sound and honourable judiciary in this country. I think they take very seriously uh, every case that comes in front of them. They take into account all of the issues. And we, as the public, place our faith in them to make a judgment on our behalf as society. But, uh, perhaps our view is, with, with Christmas coming up now, I mean, will, is there something special done at Christmas for the, for the prisons, particularly those who won't get temporary release for Christmas Day? I mean, do they put on a communal Christmas dinner and that sort of thing? I think insofar as, as prison officers can, they do their absolute best to support people. But times are changing, and certainly I would say in terms of women prisoners, they're tougher now than they were um, because either of changing attitudes to prisoners or reduced money, then lockups are much more frequent, there's less freedom in the prison. But I do, I do think that at a time like Christmas, on the one hand, uh, the, the people who are working in the prison do go out of their way. They do things like you know trying to, to make a Christmas dinner or trying mm -hmm. to be as kind. But on the other hand, Christmas is a time of memories. It's a time when and there's heightened emotion. I think in the women's prison, you know, visits from children are, are quite open and quite allowable, aren't they? Fairly regularly. Well, to, to an extent, but, you know, again, I've spoken to young women who've left behind children, some of them serving quite long sentences. So crimes that were committed for all sorts of reasons, be it through addiction, particular circumstances people found themselves in, when you've had time to reflect on that in prison, you're still left with the thought that maybe six, eight years before mm. you will actually see your child. If you've got a young child, six to eight years before you can really hold that child in your arms again, so I yes. think we need to think very, well, very seriously about well, some Alison, of those Well, Alison, I mean, Evelyn isn't too happy to see those yeah. photos. Uh, you're not going to do any more, um, well, look, as it were, intrusion you know, into Sean I, I, I life. do appreciate where you're coming from, Evelyn, you know, but I suppose, as, as Justice, you know, Elizabeth Dunn said, Sean Quinn has nobody to blame but himself. Actually in prison because of uh, contempt. Contempt, so of that's course. We, we have but he's to be doing all right careful. and he looks well okay. and there's an interest in it. You <laughs> well, know. I, I, Do all we I want can any say of is, not having visited well. many prisons, I wouldn't like to be in there myself. No. But thank you both very much for being here. Thank Coming you. up after the break, how small businesses all over the country can get us out of these tough times if the government supports them. Stay with us. Welcome back. As people all over Ireland digest the details of today's budget, everyone's agreed small businesses are the lifeblood of this country. But many employers feel they're not being given any help from the government. Eamon Delaney has this report. We are living in strange times in Ireland. 
We can bail out the banks, we can protect the upper echelons of the public sector, we can not burn the bondholders, and yet there's one constituency in our country and society which has not been supported, and which is supposed to be the actual engine of our economic recovery. That is the small business and retail community, which has been hit increasingly with a series of penalties and charges where it should be supported. The retail market has shrunk by over one-fifth in value terms since 2007 and almost 50,000 former retail employees have gone on the live register since 2008. This is Fibsborough in Dublin's North City, but in many ways it could be any Irish town or village. You see around a small community of baker shops, pubs, cafes, all of these people are feeling the pain of the current recession. But more than that, they're feeling the pain of not being supported by government and by a culture which increases the penalties on them far from supporting them. So what are these extra charges or penalties? They must pay rates, despite the fact that they would also have to pay bin charges and water charges to come. These rates have been reviewed and it's possible that they may go actually up even further. The list goes on and on. There are mooted changes in PRSI charges and increased electricity costs, despite the fact that inflation overall has not actually risen. And then there are the wider challenges of online shopping and the arrival of mass market discounters. I went out and about in Fillsborough and spoke to some of the retailers in the front line. Colm, who runs a convenience store, describes exactly his situation. Every time there's a budget, the government are looking for more money. Um, our sales are down, um, our overheads are up, and we just can't keep going the way we're going. We need people to have more disposable income in their pocket uh, to come in and actually purchase office in order for us to sustain any sort of a living. Um, at the moment, things the government has done absolutely nothing over the past couple of years to help a small business person survive. As if it wasn't bad enough for all the charges uh, and new demands being made on small business re and retailers, they have to face one further very hard challenge, and that is that rents have simply not come down during the recession. In fact, rents have stayed exactly as they are for many people who are renting for retail and small business. Water charges, bin collection, yeah. you'd think it'd all be contained under the one umbrella, rates, but it's not. They're all separate bills. Well, if they sort of leave us alone to get on with what we know best and do best, try and drive it on. I have to work about 80 hours a week because I can't afford to pay more staff. I have to do the hours myself and that's not even to uh, make money, that's just to keep the doors open. And this is what a lot of other traders in the area are telling me, whereas before they could work a normal 30 hour a week and get a living, now they're having to work anywhere between 40 and 80 hours a week just to keep their doors open. But the real question is why the retail sector and the small business community get so little support from our political culture. Here in Leinster House, we have a legislature that's dominated by farmers, teachers, public servants. Very few people from an actual business or entrepreneurial background, or so it would seem. In fact, at the last election, there were half a dozen Fine Gael TDs elected from this specific background. It was expected they would support, speak up in support of the sector, but this actually hasn't happened, much to the disappointment of the party leadership. So where do we look then for support? The retail sector, the small business community, throughout the length and breadth of Ireland are feeling the pain. Higher rates, often higher rents, or rents are not coming down, and a mixed pattern of support from the banks. And it seems that when they look to this, our political culture, that's the last place they're actually going to get any meaningful support. I'm joined now by journalist Eamon Delaney and Deputy Dominic Hannigan, who is a Labour TD from Meath East. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Eamon, a pretty hard-hitting VT there now about the problems that small businesses are having. How would you sum up the, the things that really could be changed to help them? I think uh, rent could be much more flexibly looked at. I think the problem in Ireland is that so many people have taken a hit on property that those who have taken a hit, the property owners, will not pa will, 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 want the best for their space and aren't prepared to really dramatically lower rents. Uh, I think that could be done. It's happening in some areas, it must be said. I think the banks could be more... But it's being done voluntarily by it's the, done the owners. And piecemeal in yes. some areas, but not in others. And in Fibsborough, the area you saw in, in the package there, it's certainly not being done consistently. Mm -hmm. And there's whole swathes of, of the area which lie, or uh, spaces lie vacant because of that. Um, I think the banks could be much more flexible 
uh, they have shown them an improved attitude of late and mm -hmm. they've been out on the PR mm. uh, bandwagon. Well, could could so. I just turn to that for a minute because we're getting contradictory statements from Small Firms Association, the ISME, um, saying the banks are not lending enough and yet on the <coughs> other hand the banks are announcing that they are now open to lending. Exactly, that's what it is and the statistics are equally conflicting. I think they have got better uh, and certainly the PR on it is better. It would want to be. We've bailed out the banks, we're paying for these super pensions. I mean, uh, it, it, it just is about time, you know. But, but we can only go in the evidence of what retailers are telling us and small businesses throughout the country and they're still complaining that there isn't yeah. the leniency they would have seen. Mm -hmm. um, but the other big issue is rates. Uh, now this is a confused picture. Uh, there's a race to valuation going on in Dublin at the moment. It's going to go on in the rest of the country afterwards. In some places rates are going down a little bit as promised, but in others they're going up and dramatically so. In some streets in the city centre in Dublin, I mean we've had an escalation in rents. In offices, from, for example, in the law library, the distillery building, places like that, just as an example, there's you know, very large increases, really quite unexpected. And that's really hitting retailers hard. Their margins are so tight now, they're already feeling the pain with people doing online shopping and going to the mass market, supermarkets. So the rates thing needs to be clarified. And um, the evaluation, which will probably see larger scale uh, rates, the hope would be that it could be held back for a year, to, a year or two just to give some breathing space for retailers. Uh, am I right in saying that if there's this new evaluation will last then for 10 years, is that too long a period because the market is so volatile? Well, probably not in the sense that what went before it was decades long without a change. I mean, some of the rate evaluations have been done like back in the 1950s. As I understand it, this is the way I've been told it by estate agents and that. So maybe we need to look at it much more frequently. But I mean, the whole issue of rates, retailers have always felt an injustice about this. It was taken away from householders, mm -hmm. but businesses have to pay it. And yet, and this is the key thing, they also pay the things that rates used to cover. So they now pay bin taxes, they pay water charges. It's never ending. It goes mm -hmm. on and on and on. Well, Dominic, maybe I saw you nodding there when, when Eamon said that the banks were getting better at lending to small businesses. I mean, what's your experience? You yourself have, have a background in, in a small business before you got into the doll. I do, Laura. I set up my own uh, company 17 years ago now. So I know how difficult it is and I know how important it is that companies have access to credit. And that is something that we recognise there is a problem with at the moment, but it is getting better. We had a, a report out last week uh, from the Red Sea company, which examined what businesses themselves thought about access to credit, and it is getting better. And I, I'll give you some statistics from that report. Uh, three quarters of people who had applied for loans from the banks were getting them. Uh, it was taking about a month to get them. And for those who didn't get a loan, and who then appealed it to the credit review office, over half of them, 55%, were getting uh, approval after going through the credit but, review. But Dominic, so it is we can that do that, that, that to make it easier. The government is not doing enough. Is it that they're doing enough but not selling it, or they're not doing enough? Well, I think we are, we're, we're trying to sell it, and indeed the most recent statistics uh, from the OECD show that we are getting better as a country. We're now in the top 10 countries worldwide in terms of doing business here, our ease of doing business. But, but, but we want to be number one, yeah, and our, yeah, our, our intention yeah. is by 2015, yeah, yeah. by the end of this government, we'd be the first, the best place in the world for small businesses. Certainly, to and, well, and that's, that's, that's what we want to do. I, I wish we so we can only get better. Yeah, I, I wish we wouldn't echo these grand claims of Enda Kenny. I mean, I mean I know you're from a different party, but like, it, like the best place, in the, like, let, we don't need to win the Olympics. We just need to make it tolerable for people mm. to make money. Well, we're top, we're top I know, 10. But let's, we're here, top 10 yeah, now. Here's another example. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that the sick pay laws, the changes yeah. in this, this will affect uh, businesses with over 100 people. Uh, you know, this, this is another thing to be heaped upon. It's going to accept uh, Montessori's and childcare uh, sector in particular, mm -hmm. and that's why they fought it in particular before the budget. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, it's another added penalty. So the perception is that the pain has been visited on not only the squeeze middle, but the retail sector, the small business sector of the big squeeze middle, whereas upper echelons of the public sector are protected from the Crow Park deal, mm -hmm. and the bankers get bailed out. I mean, mm -hmm. is it not the case, Dominic, that this looking at this sick pay is 
is really because the absenteeism in the public service is very worrying. It's not so bad in the private sector, and yet they're the ones that are going to get hit if, if, if this does come in. Well, actually, on, on that issue, if, if you look at the figures, uh, they, they, are, they do vary across the public and the private sector, and I don't think it's fair to, to tar one particular sector. I think it, it, it depends on the specific industry that you're in. But going back to what the government is doing and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do. we are trying to make it easier. Uh, we brought in the action plan for jobs earlier in the year with 260 different measures for how we could make it easy for small businesses to set up, survive and thrive. And we're open to suggestions. We know that we're not there yet, but we do think things are getting better. One, one example, bringing in uh, the reduction in VAT from 13.5% to 9%. We've generated almost 10,000 jobs this year yeah. as a result of that. See, well, and, it's and not, at the I'm moment, I'm yeah. afraid we're, we're going to have to mm -hmm. call it, uh, finish it at that. But I mean, there are some good news stories. Oh. And then there's also the, the, the information you got on your package. But thank you both very much indeed, thank Dominic and Eamon. Thank, thank you. you. If you'd like to get in touch with us on the show, or you have a story you'd like to tell us, you can email midweek at tv3.ie, or you can also contact us through our Facebook page. Vincent is up next. Thanks for watching. Good night.